All right, we're going to be in Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3, if you want to open up there. Jonah 3. What we're reading this morning is historical, right? It's, it's things that were recorded, but they're recorded for our learning in the present. And so I want to just encourage you that as we're reading these things, yes, these were events that happened, but God recorded them for us because the messages in them are timeless. And so the truths that are in it are just as real as the day they were penned. The experiences that Jonah went through, that the city of Nineveh went through, are real, just like the events we're going through today. And so I, I want to encourage you that as we read this, yes, we are reading what happened, but God recorded this so that we would learn the lessons from them. The good, the bad, he recorded it for us uh, to benefit until he returns. That's what he's given his, his word for, to sustain us, to grow us, to bring us to maturity in him. And I want to remind you before we get into this passage that, uh, that God is mighty to save. He is uh, powerful. And, and Jonah in chapter 2 at the end of verse 9 it said, Salvation is of the Lord, our Redeemer, the creator of heaven and earth. He is a powerful God. He sits on the throne and he orchestrates these different things. And we see within the the uh, story of Jonah within this historical account that we have here, we see both the sovereignty of God and the free will of man, and we see them interacting. And we, we see that in several ways. We see God sending Jonah and even Jonah disobeying, uh, but then still being corrected and still going within the will of the Lord. We see Nineveh that's, that's going further into sin. We know that's not where the Lord wanted him to go. But uh, we also see that the Lord sends Jonah to preach to them to bring about repentance and we, we see that in the good things that are happening, the bad things that are happening, over all of it, at all the different times, God remains in control. He remains sovereign over, over the situations, over the countries, and over the prophet, and everything at all times. And that's an amazing feat. And, and we talk about that sometimes as, as a doctrine. How can God be in control and yet still let people make decisions? Well, we see it in things like this, in Jonah. You know, uh, God sends Jonah somewhere, and Jonah says, nope, he runs away. So God sends a big fish, <laughs> and his will's still done. His will's still accomplished, and it's still accomplished through Jonah. Uh, and, and so as we're looking at these different things, uh, just be, be encouraged and be remembering, though, that God is writing this for us to grab these and to apply to our life. And I think there's a lot of things within here that apply to, to us uh, very much in the present, in, in our state, even within our country. So we're going to start in verse 10 of chapter 2. So the Lord spoke to the fish and vomited Jonah onto dry land. You know, I, I like to try to put myself in the person's spot a little bit when I'm reading. What was this like? What have it been like? And uh, I was thinking, this, is, this has been a rough few weeks for Jonah. You know, life was pretty good, for, I think, from what we kind of read before. He's a respected prophet. Um, now he's running away. He's been cast out in the middle of a storm. Now he's been sp uh, spit up by a fish. You know, like, there's, there's nothing about this that has gotten great yet. And on top of that, he has over at least, at least a 350-plus mile now journey over to Nineveh, uh, it, which he's probably not very well prepared for coming out of the fish. And, um, <laughs> you know, there had to be the gratitude, there had to be the smell, uh, both at the same time, right? This, this is a real experience. And again, we don't know if he was uh, exactly, I have my opinion, as I've shared with you, was he resurrected or kept alive? Either way, God supernaturally brought him through that time in the, in the sea and in the fish. And, uh, and so now that he's vomited up, he's going to, to Nineveh. And, and chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days 
and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Hey, Chris, would you mind getting me a bottle of water? Sorry, thank you. All right. This opening here in chapter 3 is very similar to the opening in chapter 1, verse 2. God told uh, Jonah, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for the wickedness has come up before me. Interesting little note is God does not include the message this time simply to go. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach the message that I tell you. Remember chapter 1, he gave him the message, and now uh, we see that he's just saying, hey, go to Nineveh, and when you're there, I'll tell you what to say. And I think we know that God deals with us often in this way. He leads us one step at a time. And perhaps part of that uh, reason why is because if he gave us more of what he was planning to do, we would run away. Uh, you know, he, he's uh, one, one piece at a time is easier to follow. Perhaps if we saw the whole plan, the things that God wanted to do, we'd be overwhelmed and, and quit before we got started. So this time we see that God deals with them a little different. And I think you, a lot of you can relate to this. I can relate to this. God usually gives me about what I need to know for, from the day I need to start planning it. He doesn't usually give me anything out, you know, uh, six months, a year, two years, five years, ten years. He doesn't give me a long, uh, a long range. Obviously, we have the Word of God that gives us the general commands, but when He's given us the specifics, He usually tends to lead on a need-to-know basis, not on a want-to-know basis. And, uh, and so we see that He's dealing with that with Jonah. Go to Nineveh, and when you get there, I'll give you the message. Uh, I think Jonah probably already knew what it was based on his last time. But uh, we see that, of course, Jonah goes this thing, this time. Another thing I would point out is he's only sending one man. Remember Nineveh, we talked about, is a large city. It's somewhere between 120,000 and 600,000 people, depending on the way you interpret the end of of chapter 4, if he's referencing 120,000 children or 120,000 people that are in the city. So it's a large city, and he sends only one person. I'm going to read you guys a quote. From, uh, from Spurgeon. It says, God was determined to do the work through Jonah, so he did not give up on the reluctant prophet. God is often just this committed to doing his work through a man. Suppose that the problem had been given to us to solve. How shall this city be moved to repentance? How shall its vice be forsaken and the God of Israel worshipped by all its inhabitants from the highest to the lowest? If we had not been paralyzed with despair, which is the most probable, We should nevertheless have sat down carefully to consider our plans. We should have parceled it out into missionary districts. We should have needed at least several hundred, if not thousands, of able ministers at once. Expenses would have had to been incurred. And we should have considered ourselves bound to contemplate the erection of innumerable structures in which the word of God might be preached. Our machinery would uh, would necessarily become cumbrous. We should find that we, unless... We had the full resources of an empire, could not even begin the work. But what saith the Lord concerning this? Putting aside the judgment of reason and all the plans and schemes which flesh and blood so naturally do follow, he raises up one man by a singular providence. He qualifies that one man for his mission. You know, when you think about an entire city repenting at the preaching, and you look here, we see the power of God is demonstrated. One person is sent. That's efficiency. He sends one person. And, the, and there's a thing that we need to understand. The power that worked through Jonah to, to bring the message of, of repentance to Nineveh, that is the same spirit that dwells in you and me. That's the same spirit. That's the same power. And it's not because Jonah was such an amazing prophet. It's because God was so powerful that he could use him in a powerful way even despite his shortcomings. And I want to encourage you, I want to encourage each of us this morning to remember that God can do great things through us. And I don't mean that where we should have an arrogance that we can do great things. I mean that by faith, if we're following God, God can do great things through fallen people. And that's an amazing thing to see how God works here through Jonah. He only sends one person. You know, I, I resonate with some of this. I've read several church planting books when I came out uh, this way. And when you look, when you're trying to get something going, and what you see, this is a completely, this is a work of the Lord. 
That's what, that's what is happening. And ultimately, this is what we should be seeking, a work of the Spirit of God. This is what we should be praying for, I believe, a lot uh, in our country, a work of the Lord, a work of the Lord. How many, how, many, uh, how many pastors do we need? How many pulpits do we need? How many uh, people do we need? God's incredibly efficient. He doesn't need many. He doesn't need many. Uh, one, one will suffice. And so encouragement of what God can also then do through each of you. And so don't be, don't be timid when God appoints you to a ministry because he is able to move mightily through you. There may be times you're appointed to a ministry that's unfruitful. Okay, Jonah got appointed to a really fruitful ministry, and he's one of the rare people who hated it. Um, almost everybody would have loved Jonah's ministry. Jonah's like one of the only people you could have, I think, that is sent to people. They actually listen and receive the message completely, and he's angry about it. <laughs> That's usually like a dream come, through, come true. And uh, we see that in part because I believe because we, what we see of Jonah is he's a patriot. He loves his country. He knows that Assyria is going to come in and destroy his country, carry off his people in captivity, and, uh, and he doesn't want that to happen. And so he's, I think he's just thinking, hey, God, if they don't repent and you're going to judge them, um, then that's wonderful because then they can't come in and destroy us. And so I don't want to go see them get, uh, get stronger. I don't want to see them repent. We see that within himself, and his loyalties were obviously misplaced. It should have been to God first, uh, but he he's obviously loves his people, his, his country. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 17, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Mountains are best understood as kingdoms. Kingdoms, I believe that's what it's referring to, and that God moves kingdoms. And if we walk forward in faith, trusting in him, uh, teaching his truth, and in prayer, God is able to move mountains. And we should be living in a way where we have such confidence in his ability. I'm not saying that everything will go our way or happen how we want. But if we walk in these ways, our God is able. You look at our country right now, uh, we can look at a lot of it, and I think we can go, it's unfixable. It's unfixable. Uh, unfixable for us. It's easily fixable for God. Nineveh, as we read it, Nineveh is in a bad spot. Unfixable, I think, in our eyes, but fixable to God. And we'll, uh, what, will, what will we do as a people? What, what will the hearts of our people be? We see that within Israel, and there, there's worry, of course, within our country. People have that worry uh, that, like Israel, even if the message goes out, the warning goes out, it'll fall on deaf ears. Just as he warned uh, Nineveh, he warned Israel before they'd go into captivity. But we shouldn't just accept the fact and not hope for, not pray for, and, and not within ourselves even, turning it with all of our hearts unto the Lord uh, and, and accept that the country is beyond his reach, that our nation is beyond the ability to turn. I don't, I don't think we have reached that spot yet. And, and as we see here, uh, we'll get into a little bit more. Uh, but as we'll see, they only had 40 days. That's very close to the time of destruction. It's like a last minute uh, prophet sent in, not even six weeks before destruction is going to hit this city. And God is still, still willing to send a messenger, still willing to listen if the people will turn. It says, so Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. You know, as I read that, and I, I wonder to myself, how many times is God wanting to send us, but we're unwilling to go? How many times is God willing to send you? How many times is he wanting to send me? Last time, Jonah ran away. This time, he went. And I'm thankful he went. And again, we should be learning from both, the good and the bad. But there's times God will send you places. There's times God will put something clearly on your heart. And you can suppress it. You can say no, or you can do it. I know, I, I know and I, I'll say I've done both at different times. I've been able sometimes to go up and share with people. So the Lord will put something on my heart, walk up to somebody and share with them. 
I can remember one time uh, I was on a trip. I don't remember the, all the details, but I remember one time on a trip, God was saying, go share with that person. And I was like, no, I'm on vacation. Um, <laughs> Should have gone. I, was, I, I don't think I was in full-time ministry at that point anyway, but the point was I was mentally, I was going, no, no, this is me time. Um, I should have gone. Should have gone. And, and those, are, those are lessons, I think, that also we should be learning. And when God sends us somewhere, be willing to go. I think we still struggle with this in a lot of ways today, personally. I think a lot of us will tell God, Lord, I'm willing to go as long as you give me a job I want to do. Kind of like Jonah. If you send me to tell Israel that you're going to bless them and expand the borders, I'm your guy. If you want me to go to the enemy and, and tell them how they can be saved, find somebody else. And I think we can actually have that same attitude often in ministry. If I'm willing to do this, I'm willing to do this, but I'm not willing to do that. And I encourage you, uh, there's gifting, there's, there's callings, different people have, but when the Lord calls you somewhere, don't say no. Don't say, no, Lord, I don't want that ministry. Accept it, embrace it, and be faithful with it. And so I encourage you to, to reflect on that and go, okay, am I really open? And I encourage you to be open. Lord, whatever you call me to, just help me to say yes and to be faithful and have the confidence in your ability to accomplish what you want. That you are able to, walk, uh, to work through me. We also see that Jonah, by the mercy of God, the second time, remember, he was still being dealt with with some firm correction, loving correction. But he had received some firm correction. And we see that he's going to continue to work on it. And I do believe that uh, as Noah, uh, after jo Noah, Jonah, after he wrote this book, I do believe he really matured a whole lot through the book. I think that's why it's written this way, why he recorded all our, his mistakes, is because he wants us to understand how God brought him to maturity through these different things. Now, Nineveh, it says, was a, an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. That might have uh, included a few other cities that were right around it. They were started at the same time, listed there in Genesis chapter 10, when this city was originally built. Uh, they were started at the same time. It could be very similar, like if God modern day said he sent somebody to Dallas. And the question is then, well, did that include like Richardson and Plano and places like that? Or was it like literally just in the county border? And so most likely it's also including these other cities when he talks about a three-day extent. Uh, that are basically just all touching it, that he was sent to the Nineveh city or the Nineveh area. Uh, but either way, it was a great city, and either way, of course, it was a three-day journey. And some, uh, some archaeologists will try to argue that based on modern-day discoveries that that city size is impossible. Uh, one, if you do include the other cities right around it, it is entirely possible. Uh, so that's one explanation. And the other explanation is we just haven't dug down enough. Uh, there was more to uncover. I am certain and I am 100% confident the Word of God recorded it accurately. And I am also confident that archaeology will not disagree with it. And if there's anything that's a confusion, it will be explained or it's being twisted by people who don't want the Bible to be right. And so I just want to, I'm bringing that up. There's little things I'll bring up sometimes like that because I want to encourage you guys, if you hear something like that, don't let it rattle you. Don't let it shake you. Uh, if you study archaeology in the Bible, you'll find people talk about stuff uh, that they'll tell you there's no evidence. And if you go study, you'll find amazing evidence. Uh, you, you can do that during the time of Christ. The idea of did he die? Were the disciples real? Can we show that the documents are actually that old? There's amazing evidence for that stuff. If you go all the way back to the time of Egypt with Joseph in Egypt and the Exodus and all those things, archaeologists will tell you there's no evidence. There's tons and tons of evidence. Uh, uh, some things they've uncovered. You know, they've uncovered in Egypt by the River Joseph a, a governor's house with a mini pyramid, and inside there's a guy with a coat of many colors. But that's no evidence for Joseph. That's what archaeologists say. But you're like, yeah, right, from the right time frame. Biblically speaking, they'll try to push it forward. 400 years is what they do to try to mess it up. Um, but I, anyway, I'm getting off topic there. The point is, is that they'll try to spin things to discredit the Bible. And I just want to encourage you, when you hear those things, have confidence in the Word of God. In, in time, I believe it's always proven true. 
So this is either way, whether it's just a reference to the city or the city and its surrounding areas, it is a large city. It's a great city. It's a powerful and impressive city in the eyes of men. There's massive buildings within this city. Uh, they looked a lot better than our movies project. You know, the buildings looked 2,000 years ago. Uh, they weren't partial cavemen or anything like that. They're obviously, they're, they're, they're civilized people, and they are going to get homes comfortable and things just like we do. How are our homes going to look, you think, in like, you know, 2,700 years? They're not going to look so sharp. Uh, if there's any remains, it's not going to be anything like what we lived in, right? And, uh, and I think the ver- it's very similar when we look at these ancient cities. So this is, a, uh, I'm sure, an impressive city when you walked in it in its time. And the three-day journey could be a reference. So that means it took, takes three days to walk around the city, just like in a circle, basically, if you walked around the entire city. Or it could also be a reference to it takes three, three days, basically, to walk through the city as, he's, as he was um, preaching, referring to the size of it. Anyway. Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Yeah, there we have that forty days, forty days, less than six weeks. You know, I know, uh, I know I've heard people say that we're, we're beyond the point of, of any return, like the America as a country. I've heard, I've heard preachers that believe that or teachers that think that. And God's in control. If we, if we are, he's, he, can, he can bring forth any form of uh, punishment or judgment that he wants. If he wants to harden the heart of our, of our leaders, of our, of our country, he's able. But I also see passages like this, and I go, you know, here's Jonah. He's sent, and it's, it's only 40 days in advance. Uh, this destruction that's being warned of, overthrown, uh, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, who's a Messianic Jew, he, he says that this... Uh, is a technical term for the judgment that happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's the way it would have been understood in the time that he wrote it. And so he's saying the city in 40 days will be overthrown like the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. It will be destroyed by God. That's a strong, a strong prophecy. And very close, very close to the time. You know, I think most people, even if they think our country's falling, I don't think they actually expect it to be gone in six weeks. I don't think they expect this judgment to come on in six weeks. I think they expect it still to happen more over time. Uh, what does that mean to me? It means, well, uh, church, we should, be, we should be praying. We should be preaching the gospel, and we should be asking God, Lord, do a work that only you can do and change the hearts of people in this country. Bring them to repentance. Bring them to faith in you. We should be praying that for our country, for our leaders, for the different people in charge. And, and also, I encourage you to not lose hope not to lose hope within those things. I don't believe that our hope, of course, should be in, a, in an institutional system, in a government system. I'm thankful when we have a good government. I'm thankful for the country we get to live in. But our faith is not there. But at the same time, we want to make sure uh, that we are impacting the culture. And if we sometimes just accept, well, judgment's coming. You know, even at this point, 40 days, I, I could personally kind of see a lot of people going, yep, that's what I expected. I knew we were heading for judgment. And throw in the towel. Yep, I knew that was coming. Better hunker down. And, uh, and I would encourage you during that 40 days to, to pay attention. What did the people do? What did the people do that God noticed? <laughs> I also find it uh, interesting. We'll get into this a little bit more. As the people, Jonah comes preaching fire and brimstone. You remember, Jonah didn't want these people to repent. God wants the people of Nineveh to repent. Jonah didn't want them to repent. He's hoping, and we read this more in chapter 4. This is my opinion at all. He's hoping that they don't repent. (laughs) Uh, And so I find it interesting that he comes warring, you know, of the destruction that's coming. But we don't see right here that he's recording that he preached the part of repent. Turn to God. And I don't know exactly how it happened. I think he did say it at some point. I don't know if he used a specific term. I mean, obviously, it's a different language. Uh, but that he told the people what to do. I think that's how they figured out what to do, as Jonah told them. Uh, but we see that he comes out bringing the, the judgment message. And I almost wonder if the people had to go up to him and ask him, what do we do? And he's like, dang it, i got to tell them now. Um, 
I don't know, but, but it seems that he's, rep- uh, to me, that there's something in his message that's still showing, okay, fine, I'll go preach about the destruction that's coming, and I'll warn them of the judgment that's coming, but uh, he didn't go, you know, uh, when Jesus started his ministry, he preached, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it, it almost seemed that the people maybe had to go to Jonah and say, hey, how, what do we do? What do we do? As opposed to it being included when he was preaching out in the streets, doing his street preaching. Um, maybe he included it in there. Maybe that's, a, maybe that's just something I, I see in that. But it, to me, it seems uh, that there's something and that he's only preaching of the judgment right here. But verse 5, so the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. They obviously had a fitting response. And where did they get that? And again, that probably came from Jonah. Uh, but it didn't seem that it was part of his original message. It seems in some ways that it was some form of a response. But the people here are hearing the preaching. And here's the, the amazing part. And this is the thing that changes everything. It says the people believed God. It's that simple statement that transforms a culture. The people believed God. It's amazing how everything in life changes with that statement. Simply, if you believe him. If you believe him, then those who are dead come to life by faith. Those who walk in darkness come to the light. Those who were once deceived are now enlightened. And we see that there is so much challenge from our society and modern, modern Archaeologists, professors, scientists, writings, uh, even politicians, or even from the, within the church, we see people fight and stand up unashamed for evil practices. And you see that there's this common thread. What's the common thread? They all challenge the truth claims of God. That's the common thread. They're all challenging this. And what happened with these people is God sends in a prophet, and the people actually believe that the prophet is from God. And they go, hey, what he's saying, I think it's really going to happen. I think in 40 days, fire is going to rain down on this city, and we're going to be toast. We're going to be judged by God. And they understood that. And I think about this, and and just look at our society. How different would our society look if the majority or all people believed God? If they all agreed that the word of God was absolute truth, what if they all agreed on that? Even if they didn't follow him necessarily, and obviously these people repent, but what if that was a universal principle? What would that do to a society that changes everything? How fast would we see all these things change in our society? How fast would, this, would the arguments of gay marriage go away? How fast would the discussions about abortion go away? How fast would, this, would the conversations of corruption being okay or not okay go away? If we simply believed what the word of God says. And that's a powerful statement. It says the people believed God. You know, this is also the part for us that we can testify. When did your life change? When did you become saved? When you heard the truth came to God and you believed. When you say, Lord, I believe, I believe what you said, it changes everything. And what's amazing right here, what happened in Nineveh, is the society as a whole, their hearts have been changed. They hear this preaching, and and the entire city is going, "I, I believe, I believe. And we see that God is doing a work here through his, uh, through his reluctant prophet. That's what, um, that is also, again, just so amazing, is he sends one person, and the one person he sends doesn't, doesn't even want to be there. He doesn't want to see success in the, in the ministry that he's given. He doesn't want the people to repent. So he says, okay, God, I'm going to go because you sent me. I'm going to preach the message. And God does this amazing thing and changes this entire city. This entire city gets changed for God from this one prophet who didn't even want to go. Because that's the power that God can do working through somebody. Verse 6. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, 
Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Even the king, you know, verse 5 said, The people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. This repentance that was taking place, it, it didn't matter somebody's uh, ethnical background. It didn't matter their social status. It didn't matter how wealthy they were. This message was penetrating the hearts of people, and they were accepting it right up to the king. The king uh, here is, is most, most likely uh, Adad Narari III. It would be his name. We don't have that mentioned here in this book, but he reigned during the time of Jeroboam II. And we see here that he incredibly humbles himself and orders the people to turn to God, right? The one true God, the God of Israel. And I want to break down a little bit the things that he did. He arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. These are the, the first things that he did. We don't see, of course, the word repentance used here, but we clearly see the action. He arose from his throne. This is a mark of humility, right? Second, he laid aside his robe. This, again, shows humility. He's gotten off the throne. He's removed his royal robe. And third, he covered himself with sackcloth. What was sackcloth? It's a, uh, probably an uncomfortable covering made from goat hair, usually dark in color. And it's, um, it's worn to express uh, contrition, to express lamentation, mourning, supplication, or repentance. Closest thing I could think of, it's not an exact fit, but it's like, uh, like uh, funeral clothing. Uh, he, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, he's showing by what he's doing that he's heartbroken about what's about to happen, and he's recognizing his offense against God. That's what he's doing by putting these things on. He's removed these uh, uh, comforts and these marks of power, and he's humbling himself putting on these uncomfortable things that, that mark a time of mourning, a time of sorrow. And so that's what is, has shifted here in the king. Uh, they continued with the, the sackcloth. That's, that, they did that for uh, thousands of years as far as that form of a clothing being used uh, to express that. But this is very position, a uh, very humble position for any king to take, let alone a Gentile king. Remember, this is not even a Jewish king. He hears this message, uh, and he understands, I've sinned against the living God. He understands that, and he is being quick to repent. It was known, Assyria was known as a very violent city, very violent in, in the way that they dealt with people, and obviously their sin uh, was great at the time, meaning that the, the city was, it was an evil place because it was on the verge of destruction. From their sin. And Proverbs 22.3 says, A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself, but a simple pass on and are punished. Now look at this king, and as he hears the message, he begins mourning. He, he, he goes to this humble position. And, you know, it's easy for us to assume that position after death has come in from our sin. It's easy to have regret and remorse after it's had a huge cost. After you've maybe destroyed your name, maybe, or after you've uh, hurt or destroyed a marriage or a friendship or relationship, or you've been caught doing something. At that point, I think usually for us, it's easy uh, to go, yeah, that was, that, was, that was wrong, and I shouldn't have done that. But this man, and that's what it says here in this proverb, proof man foresees evil and hides himself. He, he, he looked and goes, yeah, judgment is coming. What I've done is wrong. And before the consequences hit, he turns. He repents. And this is a significant thing. And again, this goes back because he's believing God. Uh, I've gotten to see this over different years. And there's a big change when somebody has a self-conviction to get out of something or when somebody wants uh, something to go away because of all the pain that a sin has brought into their life. 
and destruction was about to come. This king was going to be in sackcloth. He was going to be mourning in the next six weeks. He recognized that. He said, I'm going to start mourning now and cry out to God for mercy. I'm going to change. I'm going to do things different. That's what it says, the simple pass on and are punished. Yep, sin brings death. Yeah, judgment's coming, but they don't change it. They don't do anything. They just continue on, and they will mourn once the judgment hits. But the wise man, like this king, and we see he's very wise, he sat down in the ashes. That, again, shows humility. It could be referring to himself as but dust and ashes before God Almighty. The, the, the idea of what he's portraying himself there. And these are for sure acts of genuine sorrow that he's recognizing that he has an offense towards God and that he's crying out for mercy. He sees this in advance and he's crying out, Lord, you're right, I've sinned. This city city is evil. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. And he says this to the people. He issues a decree. Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Everyone's to fast. You know, th- this king, I think, I think from what we read and what he was doing already, he's leading the example. He's not just telling the people. He's turning to the Lord. He's humbling himself. And now he's putting out a decree. Everybody's going to. Now, the people are already doing it. We know that back from verse 5. The people are doing it. But the king's now giving specific command. Everybody's doing it. Nobody's exempt. This is a serious fast. I don't know if you've ever tried to fast from water, even if this is a 24-hour fast or something. If you ever tried to fast from water... That, that is one of the hardest things you could ever try to fast from. I don't think you could continue for a normal day if, you're, if you fasted from water. So I think in a lot of ways, too, I look at this and go, he shut the country down, or at least he shut the city down. He shut it down. Everybody, stop what you're doing and fast and pray. That's what we see here. Turn from the wickedness. I don't know how long they were supposed to fast during that time. You know, we don't have a specific things given there. But either way, this is a very difficult fast. Uh, you, I said, water, you go without water for just uh, 8 to 10 hours, and you'll be unbelievably parched. They're all to put on sackcloth, right? Even the animals, this, this sign of humility and mourning and forsaking the comforts of this life, they're all supposed to put this on, and even to the animals, Uh, Isaiah chapter 58 gives us some insights as to fasting, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable to the Lord. I'm going to read a few verses out of it. I I encourage you to go read Isaiah 58 later and really meditate on the things here that are talked about within fasting. But Isaiah 58, we're going to start in verse 3. It says, Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no uh, no notice? In fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. So these people, the Jewish people, they're basically crying out to God, hey, we're fasting and stuff, and you don't even seem to care. You're not replying. Uh, and, and God's re, uh, replying, in fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate and to strike with the fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. Is it a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast, an acceptable day of the Lord? Is this not a fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is not to share your bread with the hungry, and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out? When you see the naked, that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh." You know, he's getting into here, a fast is much more than just not eating. It's turning to God, it's submitting, and it's crying out to him. It's way more than simply just uh, stopping eating food. The physical part, if it's done by itself, God has no pleasure in. He doesn't just love, he he doesn't go, oh, man, they're not eating, I love that. Uh, The idea is that we're forsaking our own comfort, we're forsaking these things, and God, we need you. We need you, and we're crying out, Lord. 
Have mercy on us. We're crying out to you. We're seeking you intently. And the heart, of course, matters to God. The external action apart from the heart means nothing. Uh, Maybe this isn't the best example, but for me this helps. uh, Because God always paints the picture of marriage. Marriage between uh, him and the church or him and Israel. And I think of it uh, very much if we think of, of your wife going and working out. You know, if your wife's working out and she's saying, you know, I just want to take care of my body. I want to look nice for you. I want to um, do things. I'm trying to, I, I'm, I, it's not fun for me, but I'm doing these things because I love you and I want to look nice for you. We go, well, I appreciate that. That's a, that's a nice gesture. On the other hand, if she's doing these physical exercises, but she's not doing them for you, she's doing them so other people notice her and that she's beautiful, and, and she has no interest in what effect really you have, on you, but she's really doing it because she wants other people's attention. It really actually has the opposite effect. Where you're like, well, I don't like that at all. <laughs> and, uh, and God's the same way. He's saying, look, if you're fasting because you want to appear holy to other people, that doesn't mean anything to me. That's not personal. He wants us to be seeking him. And the point of our denying ourselves physically and doing these different things, if our heart's right, it's a powerful thing. It's a powerful statement. It's a way of saying, Lord, we need you. But if it's a physical action and our heart's not genuinely turning to God, if we think, well, I'm going to fast from this, but I still have these other sins I'm not turning from or these things God's told me to do, but I'm not listening. But I'm going to look holy because I fast. And they says, that doesn't mean anything to me. And so the heart has to be, it has to be a genuine fast. And what you, uh, what you see here within these lists is, is there's, a, there's a turn to godliness, You know, he's taking the heart off of the people. When somebody's fasting there, the things he's listing is they're now doing the things that God cares about instead of the things that they're pursuing of their own flesh. We see this change where they're like, okay, Lord, I'm seeking you, and I want to be about what what do you care about? What do you value? And they're they're striving now in this way. Not just a selfish thing to get get their own desire. But he talks about this within the fast too. It's Isaiah 58, when, when we do it the right way. It says, then your light shall bring forth like the morning. Your healing shall fr- spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, then pointing to the finger and speaking wickedness. You know, he's saying, if you guys continue in your sins, but then you fast, and you know, your heart still hasn't done anything, you're, you're, you're still not for me. And, and part of it, he, uh, he's also calling us to, and what we see here within these people, within Nineveh, is their hearts were turning to God, so they fasted. They're recognizing their sin. And so when we fast, when we learn from this fast, we should learn. Uh, and we need to fast when we fast, fast genuinely. Fast genuinely. Okay, Lord, I'm seeking you. I'm seeking you intently. And it says they cry uh, to be crying mightily to God as part of his decree. You guys are supposed to cry mightily to God. Mightily means always or forcibly, strongly, uh, with strength or insistently praying to God. Like in Luke 18, uh, where Jesus teaches a parable about praying consistent. Uh, and there's a woman that's continuing to go to a judge. He says not even a good judge, but she keeps going to the judge. And finally, the judge uh, um, gives her what she wants. She says, just so you'll leave me alone. Uh, And he says, but how much more when you go to before your God, who is a righteous judge, and you cry out before him? How much more will he hear you? So he says, so do not lose heart when you're praying. But the men always ought to pray. That's what he says, what it says there in Luke 18. And here he is calling them to pray mightily, pray consistently. You know, I think right now within our country, I think three weeks ago, people were praying really strong. Question, has it continued for you? Will it continue even no matter what happens with the, with the elections? Because what we need is not just the right president. What we need is a revival. What happened to this king, that's what we want to happen here. That's what we should be praying, Lord, that the heart of, of, of the rulers of, of our Congress, of our Senate, of our president, that are of our Supreme Court, Lord, that they would turn to you. Lord, that the hearts of our nation, the people, would turn to you. We should be praying for that because prayer is a powerful tool. And then he says, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. 
You know, part of turning, part of seeking God is, of course, turning from sin. That's, of course, a natural part because sin separates us from God. Turning from sin to God. This has actually become much of a, uh, of a doctrinal debate uh, in different circles of is repentance necessary for salvation? And repentance is best understood as turning to God. If you turn to God, you by nature turn your back on anything that would take you the other way. That's sin, right? Uh, and so is repentance necessary for salvation? Yes, you cannot get saved if you don't turn to God. You have to turn to God. If you don't cry out to God, you can't be saved. And, and, uh, and so we have to turn to him. It's not just turning from sin, right? If somebody, if somebody stops a sin, that's not repentance because they're, they're not saved if they stop drinking, if they, if they stop looking at pornography or, or whatever it may be. They're not saved by stopping it. They're saved when they turn to Jesus Christ and they ask for mercy, for they ask for forgiveness. And that's repentance is turning to God. And when we're following God, we're by nature, of course, then not following after the world. They're going two different directions. We're going one way or the other. And so, of course, it's, uh, it's essential that anybody turn to God to be saved. In verse 9, he says this. The king says this. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? They didn't even know if it would work. You know, they got 40-day warning. And he's saying we should do everything we can to petition the God of heaven that he might relent from this judgment. And he did. And he did. And I think this is an encouragement to us, too. Don't lose heart. We should, be, we should be seeking God like this either way. We should be turning from the evil in our hearts, in our lives, either way. We should be crying out to God either way. No matter what if, where, where it ends up with our, with our country or if our country turns or our country doesn't turn, we should have these hearts towards God. And we should also have that, uh, that hope that here, who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? It's awesome to see what God did. And I love also, though, to see the way that these people responded. You know, we can read other examples in the Old Testament. Jeremiah spent his whole, his whole ministry preaching, and nobody listened. Noah spent his, his ministry. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. That's what Hebrews tells us. And nobody listened. His kids listened. But nobody else got saved. These men still had powerful ministries. But I think there's always should be this hope for us. Who can tell if God will turn and relent? These, this, this king said, listen, guys, I'm going to turn to God uh, because that's our greatest hope. That's our greatest hope. And this, was, this what we see is a, is a wise king, a wise king. He may have been a Gentile king, but he was wiser than a lot of the kings of Israel. Obviously, the city was not spared indefinitely. You know, the city, I think, it was about 100 or 150 years before they were, they were destroyed. But they were spared from this. This generation was completely spared from it because they turned and they followed God. Uh, verse 10, then God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them and he did not do it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Because they turned, the coming distract, the destruction was turned away. Again, this is most real in our lives. When we've placed our faith in Christ, we were heading for certain destruction. It was going to be here before we know it. We were all heading for eternal, uh, eternity in hell. That's where we were going. We were guilty before God, and we were heading for eternal judgment. But when you cry out to God, and you say, Lord, I recognize I have sinned. I have fallen short. Have mercy. You know, God delights in mercy, and that's even why he came. That's because he paid for our sins. That's why he came down, to make a payment for our sins, because he would rather forgive us than judge us. That's an amazing king, and if you have not accepted his offer of salvation this morning, I invite you, accept his offer. Be wise like this king. Don't go, uh, don't go through life 
as the fool who, who has no concern for the coming judgment. God has given us a warning. This life's temporary. You'll die once, but after this, there's a second death. And he tells us, and he warns us, that's the one you should be worried about. But if you place your faith in me, if you turn to me, I'll give you everlasting life. I'll pay for your sins because I've died in your place to pay for your sins. And I'll wash your sins away and make you white as snow. That's the offer God has given. And if you've accepted it, then you've already also experienced this transformational work. And thank you, Jesus, for that. If you haven't accepted it, I encourage you to do it right where you are. Pray it in your heart. Ask God, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I want to follow you. I don't want to go down this path that leads to judgment. I want to encourage you also, if there's areas in your sin where where you can be like Israel, maybe you acknowledge there's the one true God, but maybe also you have these sins that you're not willing to give up. It's time to give them up. It's time to give them up. Don't let them bring the death. Don't let them bring the pain. Don't Don't have all those things come in first before you say, yeah, God was right. Agree with him now. They believed God. And when as you read the word of God, believe him now. Believe him before the judgment comes. And I also want to continue to encourage you guys, keep praying for for, uh, each other and keep praying for our nation. It doesn't take a powerful or great machine to change a nation. It takes a powerful work of God. And he is able. He is mighty. And so I want to encourage you, be faithful in prayer. And when you, when you are uh, struggling in your, in your flesh in any way to lose any form of hope, remember, God is powerful, and he changes things, and he appoints kings, he appoints rulers, and he can transform hearts and lives. He can take that which is dead and make it alive. He took the most evil city in the time, and it turned around in a matter of weeks from one reluctant prophet. That's an amazing work of God. Thank you, Lord, for that amazing work. And church, remember, he can do that through us. He can do that still through us. Thank you, Lord, for the grace that we've experienced. Amen? Thank you, Lord, for the salvation that we have come to know. Thank you, Lord, that he delights in mercy. Thank you, Lord, that when our hearts turn to him, that he cares for his love that he has towards us, both the Jews and the Gentiles. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What an awesome God that he delights so much in mercy that he wants if we'll just set, but bring our, our sins before him. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. I don't want to lead you in the wrong way. This doesn't just mean that you get to say, hey, Lord, here's what I did. Say, thank you, I'm forgiven. <laughs> Part of believing God is you're agreeing with him. We're not saved in any way by good works. We're not at all. But as we agree with God and he exposes sin in our lives, we should be striving to change. We should be striving towards godliness. Uh, we should be striving to be more like him, completely and 100% saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. But then after we're saved by the blood of Christ, Our lives should be about loving him. And anything that separates us from him, we should want it out. Cast it off and continue to chase him. And when you stumble, thank God for his grace. Get up and keep going. Keep going. Lord, we thank you for this time this morning. I thank you, Father, for this uh, examples you give us, Father. Lord, I thank you that you are a God that is merciful. Lord, you are a a frightening enemy. Your destruction, Lord, if you bring destruction, Father, is uh, nobody, Lord, can can resist. Nobody can fight against you, Lord, with any form of victory or hope of victory. But, Lord, that you delight in mercy, Father. Lord, that if we turn, if if we cry out to you, that you hear us, Lord, I thank you. And, Lord, again, I pray this morning, if anybody has not, Lord, surrendered their life yet to you this morning, Lord, I pray, Father, that where they sit, that they would do that right now, that they would place their faith in you. Lord, for us as, uh, that have come to know you, I pray, Lord, I pray, Father, that during this week, as we reflect, Lord, on things to be thankful for, Lord, that the thing we'd be most thankful for is your salvation. Thank you, Lord, that you have spared us from the judgment to come, that we have hope 
because of you. Thank you. Lord, we love you and we need you. I pray for your blessing on this congregation, Lord, this week. In Jesus' name, amen.